the ground beneath Japan began shaking at exactly 5.03 p.m. local time. At nearly the same moment, an X-1.7 solar flare was already racing toward Earth at over a million miles per hour. Two forces of nature, one from below, one from above, both targeting the same island nation on the same day. The earthquake measured 6.8. The solar storm will hit tomorrow, but neither threat tells the complete story of what Japan is really facing. Because while the world watched one disaster unfold, scientists were calculating the probability of something far worse. At Undro 803 UTC this morning, seismographs across northeastern Japan registered a violent 6.8 magnitude earthquake, 231 kilometers off the coast of Honshu. The epicenter, 39.85 degrees north, 144.07 degrees east, placed the rupture directly in one of Earth's most seismically active zones where the Pacific Plate continuously grinds beneath the Japanese archipelago. The Japan Meteorological Agency immediately issued tsunami advisories for Iwate Prefecture as the quake's shallow depth, just 10 kilometers below the seabed, sent shockwaves rippling through the Pacific. In earthquake science, shallow means dangerous. The closer to the surface, the more violent the shaking, the higher the tsunami risk. Within 51 minutes, a magnitude 6.4 aftershock struck. The ground hadn't finished settling when the next tremor hit. Magnitude 5.5, then 5.6, then 5.9. The sequence was textbook for a major seismic event, powerful, shallow, and relentlessly persistent. Across northeastern Honshu, the earthquake registered as Shindo Intensity 4 on Japan's uniquely precise scale. Strong enough to wake sleeping people, rattle dishes, and stop suspended objects from swinging. Bullet trains ground to precautionary halts along the Tohoku Shinkansen line. Coastal residents in Iwate Prefecture received evacuation advisories, watching the ocean with the practiced wariness of a people who have learned to read the sea's moods. Nuclear facilities across the region immediately conducted safety checks. The Fukushima Daiichi plant, still scarred from 2011, reported no abnormalities. Onagawa Nuclear Power Plant confirmed all systems remained stable. No buildings collapsed, no infrastructure failed, no lives were lost. But seismologists knew immediately this wasn't just another earthquake. The location, the depth, the intensity pattern, the rapid succession of significant aftershocks. It was striking uncomfortably close to one of the most dangerous fault systems on Earth. The Japan Trench, where the 2011 Tohoku earthquake changed global understanding of seismic risk forever, and 28 minutes before the earthquake struck, something else had happened. 93 million miles away that would soon affect Japan in ways no building code could address. Japan exists because of violence. The entire archipelago was born from the collision and subduction of massive tectonic plates in a process that continues today, millimeter by millimeter year after year. The country sits directly on the Pacific Ring of Fire, where four enormous plates, Pacific, Philippine Sea, Eurasian, and North American, converge in geological chaos. Today's earthquake struck along the Japan Trench, a deep oceanic depression where the Pacific Plate dives beneath the North American Plate at a rate of approximately eight centimeters per year. That might sound gradual, but over geological time it represents catastrophic force. Every year, that relentless grinding builds pressure along the plate boundary, storing energy like a compressed spring. Satellite interferometry data shows the seafloor in this region has been accumulating strain for decades. GPS stations across northeastern Japan have recorded subtle but persistent movement as the plates lock and load. The shallow depth of this morning's earthquake, between 10 and 16 kilometers, indicates the rupture occurred near the plate boundary interface, the exact zone where mega earthquakes are born. When tectonic plates stick rather than slide smoothly, stress accumulates until the rock can no longer hold. The sudden release sends seismic waves radiating outward at speeds of up to seven kilometers per second through solid rock. Today's case, those waves traveled from the epicenter to the Japanese coast in less than two minutes. The Japan Meteorological Agency has calculated a 70% probability of strong aftershocks continuing for the next week, with the highest risk concentrated in the next two to three days. Each aftershock represents the Earth's crust seeking a new equilibrium, adjusting to the sudden stress redistribution. 
Some aftershocks can actually exceed the original earthquake in magnitude, a sobering reminder that the initial event is often just the beginning. But while seismologists monitored the ongoing aftershock sequence, space weather specialists were tracking a different kind of energy release. At 0735 UTC, just 28 minutes before the earthquake, active region 4274 on the sun's surface erupted with an X1.7 class solar flare, a massive explosion that launched billions of tons of plasma toward Earth at speeds exceeding 1 million miles per hour. Solar flares occur when magnetic field lines in the sun's corona suddenly reconnect and release tremendous energy. An X1.7 flare ranks as strong on the NOAA space weather scale, capable of causing radio blackouts and degrading GPS accuracy. But the real concern isn't the flare itself. It's the coronal mass ejection it likely triggered. When solar plasma reaches Earth's magnetic field, it can induce geomagnetic storms that disrupt satellite operations, radio communications, and electrical grids. For a nation like Japan, dependent on sophisticated early warning systems and emergency communications, the timing couldn't be worse. Yet what makes this location particularly ominous isn't just today's earthquake or tomorrow's solar storm. It's where Japan's true seismic time bomb is ticking. March 11, 2011, 2.46 p.m. local time, a magnitude 9.1 earthquake ruptured along this same Japan trench system. 130 kilometers east of today's epicenter. In six minutes, a fault zone 500 kilometers long and 200 kilometers wide suddenly displaced, moving the seafloor up to 50 meters horizontally and 20 meters vertically. Hiroshi Takahashi was working in his office in Sendai when the shaking began. At first, it felt like a normal earthquake, he would later tell reporters. Then it kept going and going. We realized this was different. The ground shook so violently that people couldn't stand. Cars bounced like toys in a child's playroom. Office buildings swayed so dramatically that some touched neighboring structures. The seismic waves were just the beginning. Within minutes, tsunami waves began forming in the deep Pacific. As they raced toward shore at jet aircraft speeds, the waves compressed and grew. What started as barely perceptible bulges in the open ocean became towering walls of water up to 40 meters high, taller than a 10-story building. And survivors in coastal communities described the ocean suddenly retreating, exposing vast areas of seafloor littered with stranded fish and boats. Then came the sound, a low rumble like distant thunder that grew steadily louder. The ocean returned as a black wall of water carrying cars, buildings, boats, and debris, moving inland at highway speeds. In Minami Sanriku, a town of 17,000 people, the three-story disaster prevention building was supposed to be a refuge. Mayor Jinsato and dozens of others climbed to the roof as the tsunami approached. They watched the water rise to the second floor, then the third. Sato and a handful of others survived by clinging to the radio antenna as the waves swept over the building. The town was erased. At the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, the earthquake knocked out external power. The tsunami overwhelmed seawalls and flooded backup generators. Without cooling systems, three reactor cores melted down. Hydrogen explosions damaged containment buildings. Radioactive material spread across 1,000 square kilometers. Nearly 20,000 people died. Entire communities simply vanished from the map. Recovery took years. Some communities were never rebuilt. The psychological scars run deeper than any physical reconstruction could heal. Survivors speak of tsunami dreams, nightmares where the water returns. Children who lived through 2011 still flinch during earthquake drills. Today's earthquake occurred in the same geological system, the same fault network. The same unstable boundary, where the Pacific Plate continues its relentless descent beneath Japan. The epicenter was close enough to the 2011 rupture zone to remind every seismologist in Japan that this system remains dangerously active. But here's what truly haunts earthquake scientists. The 2011 Tohoku earthquake, catastrophic as it was, wasn't Japan's worst case scenario. That distinction belongs to a fault system 400 kilometers to the southwest where the next mega earthquake could affect 10 times as many people. And now, scientists fear history may be repeating itself, just not where anyone expected. 
While this morning's earthquake grabbed international headlines, Japan's most serious seismic threat lies along a completely different fault system called the Nankai Trough. This 700-kilometer-long depression runs along Japan's southwestern coast from the Suruga Bay near Mount Fuji to the waters off Kyushu. Government scientists have calculated a 60 to 90 percent probability of a magnitude 8 to 9 earthquake striking along the Nankai Trough within the next 30 years. When, not if, this fault system ruptures, it could directly affect 30 million people across southwestern Japan, including the megacities of Osaka, Nagoya, and potentially Tokyo. The numbers are staggering. Government estimates suggest 320,000 deaths, 2.3 million destroyed buildings, and economic damage reaching 220 trillion yen, roughly 1.4 trillion towers enough to devastate Japan's economy and send shockwaves through global markets. Unlike this morning's earthquake in the relatively remote North Pacific, a Nankai trough rupture would strike Japan's industrial heartland. The Osaka Bay area alone contains 20% of Japan's manufacturing capacity. Nagoya is home to Toyota's main production facilities. The port of Nagoya handles more international cargo than any other Japanese port. Historical records show the Nankai Trough experiences major earthquakes approximately every 100 to 150 years. The last significant rupture occurred in 1946, 79 years ago. Geological surveys indicate the fault system has been accumulating stress for decades, with some segments showing signs of increasing activity. Dr. Naoshi Hirata, chairman of the government's Earthquake Research Committee, has called the Nankai Trough Japan's next inevitable disaster. The question isn't whether it will happen, but when and whether Japan can adequately prepare for an earthquake that could be three times larger than the 2011 Tohoku event. Meanwhile, the solar flare that erupted just minutes before this morning's earthquake continues racing toward Earth. The coronal mass ejection is expected to arrive between November 10 and 11, potentially triggering G1 to G2 class geomagnetic storms. While classified as minor to moderate, these storms could disrupt GPS accuracy, interfere with radio communications, and potentially damage satellites. For Japan, the timing is particularly concerning. The country's sophisticated earthquake early warning system relies on a network of seismometers, GPS stations, and satellite communications to detect seismic activity and issue alerts within seconds. During a major earthquake, when every second of warning time can save thousands of lives, any degradation in communication systems becomes a critical vulnerability. The J-Alert emergency broadcast system, designed to instantly notify the public of natural disasters, depends on satellite links that could be affected by geomagnetic activity. The Shinkansen Bullet Train Network uses GPS-assisted positioning systems for safety monitoring. Even tsunami warning buoys in the Pacific rely on satellite communications to relay wave height data. Two separate threats from two separate sources, the Earth's interior and the Sun's corona, both converging on Japan within hours of each other. Scientists emphasize there's no causal relationship between solar flares and earthquakes, but the coincidental timing highlights Japan's vulnerability to multiple simultaneous natural hazards. Because what happens next could rewrite maps. The aftershocks from this morning's earthquake continue rolling across northeastern Japan. Each tremor is recorded by a network of over 4,000 Earth seismometers that make Japan's earthquake monitoring system the most sophisticated on Earth. Every vibration, every micro-movements is cataloged, analyzed, and fed into computer models that attempt to predict when and where the next major rupture will occur. But prediction remains elusive. Despite decades of research and billions of dollars in monitoring equipment, earthquake science can only estimate probabilities, not precise timing. The Earth keeps its secrets until the moment of rupture. The Nankai trough remains quiet, too quiet, according to some researchers who note the absence of the smaller precursor earthquakes that sometimes herald major events. The fault system stretches through some of Japan's most densely populated regions, beneath cities that house millions of people in buildings constructed to withstand earthquakes, but not necessarily magnitude 9 mega earthquakes accompanied by massive tsunamis. Government officials have developed scenarios for a Nankai trough earthquake that read like apocalyptic fiction. Tsunami waves up to 30 meters high could strike the Pacific coast within minutes. The Tokaido Shinkansen, the world's busiest high-speed rail line connecting Tokyo and Osaka, 
could be severed. The Tokyo metropolitan area, home to 38 million people, could experience violent shaking for over four minutes. Nuclear facilities along the southwestern coast have been reinforced since Fukushima, but a Nankai trough earthquake could test even upgraded safety systems. The Hamaoka nuclear power plant sits directly above the fault zone. The facility has been retrofitted with higher seawalls and backup power systems, but critics argue that no engineering solution can fully address the risk of a magnitude 9 earthquake occurring literally beneath a nuclear reactor. Solar storms will reach peak intensity tomorrow and Monday, potentially disrupting the very communication networks Japan would need during a major seismic emergency. Space weather models suggest minor to moderate geomagnetic effects, but even minor disruptions could cascade into major problems during a national emergency when coordination between government agencies, emergency responders, and the public becomes critical. The Japan Meteorological Agency monitors both seismic activity and space weather from its headquarters in Tokyo. Officials acknowledge the challenges of preparing for multiple simultaneous natural hazards. We practice scenarios where earthquakes damage terrestrial communications, says one agency spokesperson, but adding space weather effects creates additional complexity we're still learning to address. International seismologists watch Japan with a mixture of admiration and concern. The country has implemented building codes, early warning systems, and emergency preparations that represent the gold standard for earthquake preparedness. Japanese school children practice earthquake drills monthly. Every household is encouraged to maintain emergency supplies. Coastal communities have evacuation routes mapped to higher ground. Yet when forces this large converge, whether from deep within the earth or from 93 million miles away, Preparation can only go so far. The 2011 Tohoku earthquake exceeded all previous assumptions about possible earthquake magnitude in that region. The Nankai Trough could do the same. Climate change adds another layer of uncertainty. Rising sea levels mean tsunami waves will penetrate farther inland. Changing precipitation patterns could affect slope stability and landslide risk during major earthquakes. Some research suggests that rapid ice melting at the poles could even influence earthquake frequency by altering stress distribution in the Earth's crust. Though this remains highly speculative, what isn't speculative is Japan's position at the intersection of multiple geological and space weather hazards. The country exists in a state of perpetual preparation for the next major disaster, while hoping that preparation will prove sufficient when the time comes. The aftershocks continue. The solar storm approaches. The Nankai Trough accumulates stress with each passing day. Somewhere in the complex interplay of tectonic forces, magnetic fields, and human vulnerability. Japan's future is being written in languages we're still learning to read. The question isn't whether Japan will face another mega-earthquake. Geological evidence makes that certainty undeniable. The question is when and whether a nation of 125 million people can maintain readiness for a disaster that could redefine what catastrophe means in the 21st century. Stay informed, stay prepared, and keep watching the Earth Unleashed.